So you have to weigh up the pros and cons because each decision you make is going to come with a degree of technical debt. Hey, what's up, guys? So in this video, I wanted to share with you guys how I set up my game levels within the Unity IDE. That is to say, how I lay them out and how I organize my scene hierarchy. This is an interesting topic, I think, because everyone has their own unique approach in how to do this. And I've seen other developers, friends of mine, have very, very different approaches to mine. So anyways, let's now jump to one of my game levels. So rather than dumping all my loose game objects into one um, big list in the root of the scene hierarchy, I manage things in empty game objects and use them sort of like folders where here I've got, you know, managers, which in it has my uh, game manager, my sound manager. And you'll notice that I have an underscore. It sort of just kind of reminds me that, hey, these are manager classes. Make sure you don't accidentally delete these kind of thing. You know, in programming, we'll use the underscore as a prefix to denote kind of private variables. Then I've got my level holder, which is basically contains everything in this whole level. You know, I've got a terrain holder, ornament holder, action holder, foreground holder, water holder, um, background elements, effects. And the beautiful thing about having this kind of folder structure, it's not just useful from a, like a practical organizational perspective, but you can toggle the um, eye icon here and actually turn things on and off. Like I can turn off all the enemies and action objects. I can turn off the foreground. Often you'll have a bunch of uh, foreground elements which might be obscuring the player layer. So having it set up like this allows you to toggle things and you know hide things off and get access to other things and you don't get visually distracted uh, by other game objects. Say for example, I want to kind of focus on just the enemies. I can turn everything else off and just hone in and focus on the enemies. And also, of course, I can lock the layers so I don't accidentally click things and nudge things around. I used to do this in the layers tab because you can set up layers and lock them there. But the problem is with that, Unity has a limited amount of layers you can use. I think it's like 31 with like seven inbuilt by um, Unity, which you don't have access to. And layers are more important to use for collision, culling of cameras and lights and things like that. So you don't want to just kind of be wasting um, layers on organization and it's kind of useful early on but I'm at a point where I'm out of layers because I've got a lot of different unique um, collision interaction and that takes priority and you can lock layers by toggling the little hand here specifically useful for uh, things like manager classes uh, and cameras specifically because what often happens and you might have done this before you accidentally click your camera or even delete it accidentally you know this is, happens when you're trying to group select some objects to to delete and um, I wouldn't be the first one to have done that so having it um, structured like this and locking critical game objects like um, the camera is very useful for that so let's delve deeper into my level holder so I've got my terrain holder which is pretty self-explanatory it's all my terrain objects so within that, I've got further categories of you know, my underground section here, my above ground tiles, and then I've got like secret passages. And you can see here, when I toggle that, I've got a kind of secret passage overlay. So then I've got what I like to call an ornament holder. Ornaments are basically things that you don't really interact with. They're, they're there more for like decoration. So I've got plants, um, clutter with a bunch of rocks and you know a flapping banner. Um, now I've got animals, you know, butterflies, birds, and things like that. So it's kind of nice to separate the stuff you can actually touch and interact with, you know, like uh, barrels and crates from stuff that's purely decorative. So the action holder, this is a big one. So this is where I have all the stuff that you can interact with. And action is sort of like a convention which I've adopted. Uh, you know, some, some people call it the player layer. So here I've got doors, climbable things, ladders. And again, you know, having the ability to select these and highlight them independently. So when I select crates and barrels, it will show me a bunch of crates and barrels. So why this is also useful, it gives you this kind of overview effect, which is useful for game design. So I might select barrels and crates and say, oh, okay. So I've got a lot of these barrels and crates over here, which are destructible, they're quite fun, but you know, there's not much going on here. It makes it easy to determine if there is perhaps a kind of imbalance where, you know, too much is cluttered around one particular region. 
Then I have interactive, which is basically um, things I can um, interact with. You know, you can see here the prompt um, doors and here I've got like a, a button and here I've got one of these uh, door triggers that when I hit it, this door here will open. Then I've just got like a miscellaneous <laughs> folder, which I dump a bunch of kind of random stuff, you know, because there is also a problem where you can over organize yourself where you've got such a granular <laughs> sorting of things where it just becomes overload so you know you don't want to go too crazy with this just kind of find a find categories for your key objects and maybe just have like a extras folder where you just kind of dump the rest you know because you don't want to just end up um, spending all your time creating folders and subfolders and subfolders and forgetting to actually work on the game when that's a, a problem some people run into as well so let's talk about tiles. And by tiles, I mean the repeatable squares that make up the bulk of um, 2D game levels. You see, I don't use Unity tile maps for this. And you might be thinking, what? How is that possible? Well, you see, I prefer a more physical approach where the tiles are actually clickable and movable in the scene. And you can't do that if you use tile maps. It's kind of locked off. So I like to use a software called Tiled, which is a free to use software. You can get it on itch right now. And importantly, you can see here in one of the features, place, resize, and rotate tiles freely. Now this is an important factor. And I'll talk about that in a moment, but you can see all these cool games that have been made with it. Axiom Verge, Shovel Knight, uh, Carrion, Alba's Awakening, some really, really cool games that you might know. Uh, so this is a, you know, an, a very well established and sophisticated um, map editor. Now, once you open up the editor, you can easily create uh, new maps just by simply drawing on uh, terrain, just as you would with um, you know, the tile map system. You can then importantly go to file, export as, and you can choose a universal format like JSON rather than being locked in to a particular framework specific tool. Now that gives you the flexibility to later port the game over to another engine, should you have any reason to do so. I'm not planning to do that, but I like to have my options open because you know you never know what the future holds. And then in Unity, you can import that JSON file. You can pass through it in edit mode using like a custom editor. And then importantly, what that gives you access to is the ability to group select not just your terrain, but all the different gizmos, colliders, triggers, and move them around. And this is useful when it comes to game design because often during the process of creating a level, you decide later on that something needs to change. And um, if you're using just a tile map system, you can move just the tiles alone, but then you have to manually move all the enemies, all the different gizmos. But you can see here, I've moved with my terrain as a batch all the different um, you know, integrated components. So that's really useful, you know, and that's um, a bit of flexibility that really um, lends itself to more expressive game design, I found. Because the last situation you wanna find yourself in is designing a level, realizing something critical needs to change about the design flow, but not being really able to do it because it's just too hard, too hard to change things, too hard to go into the tile map editor and you know move around the terrain and then come back in and move around all the different um, enemies, all the different gizmos and triggers, and then it kind of um, deters you from making improvements in the level design. So I think having this just you know gives you more freedom and flexibility, and but you know each to their own, I suppose. The other thing is when you adhere to a grid-based system, the terrain wants to snap at particular grid intervals. And that's fine, but sometimes, you know, maybe I want to move this terrain over here at kind of like a, a one and a half units or two and a half units, not specifically two units. And having the ability to move the terrain tiles like this is, is good for that. But, you know, if I was making a different kind of game, let's say, uh, 8-bit pixel art retro platformer, then yeah, maybe I'd use a more rigid um, uh, grid-based approach. I mean, there's nothing inherently wrong with the tile map tooling, it's fine. It just depends on you as a developer and your process and what kind of suits you. So you have to weigh up the pros and cons because each decision you make is gonna come with a degree of technical debt and pros and cons. So you have to kind of sort out what um, you know, is best for you and what scales over you know, a, a larger project. So I might give you a quick teaser of the levels in game design. So we start at the left here, we make our way up. There'll be a hidden um, enemy under the ground, 
which uh, pops out like peekaboo, and we just kind of like bang bang, we get past him. This is a fairly easy level, it's one of the early ones, so it's just kind of like introducing the player to different mechanics and enemies. So these frogs are kind of like brain dead and just kind of hop around, so we kind of um, destroy them. Then this crow will be like, Wah! and then we'll be like, oh no, and we smash him, make our way over here. Then we have this um, classic. Uh, spinning trap, which is, you know, very reminiscent of Mario 1. <laughs> we come over here and we say, hey, what's up there? We can't jump up there, we can't do anything, so we have to go this way. So we dispatch these two enemies and we see a button here, we press that and this uh, lever will bring this ledge down, like so. And from this point, we can't quite jump up here yet, so we're like, well, I guess we have to go up. So we make our way up here, bang, 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 and we're like, oh, what's this? And then another one of these crows swoops down and we kind of smash him. And then we have a different enemy type, and this enemy type is throwing um, axes in a parabolic arc over us. So we come underneath and whoop, whoop, we get him, and we push this um, block over here, jump up, and then we have to open this door by hitting this mechanism, which will slowly raise the door, at which point it will start to come down, and we can quickly roll through, Indiana Jones style, straight into combat here, smash him, um, pop open these crates, maybe get like a health um, increase, and then we make our way into the secret passage. Music will change, lights will change, and it's like a cool area. <laughs> so for those of you who are not familiar with this project, this is my personal solo project. I'm working on it at the moment. I'm doing all the programming, all the art direction, all the game design, all the writing. But um, yeah, look, it's it's quite the laborious effort, but I'm doing what I can to make this like a really fun game that I think everyone is going to enjoy. It's a combat um, adventure side scroller with a heavy focus on this kind of destruction and destroying enemies. And I'll be releasing some critical devlogs about some of those uh, features in the near future. So if you like the sound of that or you like what you see, please do give it a wish list. I've had thousands of you wishlisted at this point and I really could not be more thankful. So thanks everyone who is supporting this project. It really means a lot to me. In the near future, I'd like to talk more about game design specifically and how I formulate my levels, the complete process from revision and drafting to you know more revision <laughs> and then translating those levels into Unity and then back to more revision. <laughs> That's typically the process. It's very cyclical and you know eventually you come up with a pretty reasonable level. But yeah, I'll be talking about those more in the future. So make sure you are subbed and belled and all that stuff so you don't miss out on those videos. All right, triggers and gizmos. Now this one is also very critical. You know, what are triggers and gizmos? Well, you might be familiar with um, the word gizmos here. You know, I've got a level exit, I've got spawn points, camera triggers, music triggers, dialogue triggers, light triggers. I use a lot of triggers. <laughs> you know, um, when I move into uh, the cave region, the music changes, I have a light intensity um, trigger which kind of makes it more dim, things like that. And you know, if I turn on my gizmos, Boom! Yeah, I mean, there's just like a <laughs> there's just a lot going on. So yeah, having this level of um, separation is useful. <laughs> so I might just give you guys a bit of a look what these might look like. So let me just turn some of these off. All right. So camera triggers. So you can see all these trigger boxes that um, when you walk into them, it has an effect on the camera. You can see here I've got a adjustment um, script on these triggers that when I touch them it will make some change. It might change the limits, the boundaries of the camera. It might change the camera offsets, things like that. I'm a big fan of framing the action. And though my camera is free flowing for the most of the level, there are areas where I like to kind of lock the camera and let the player focus on the obstacle or the challenge without it kind of moving around and distracting the player. So one such example, is um, I've got this kind of a mini boss room here, where it's sort of like a, a mini boss. So you walk through here, you get a checkpoint, and then you walk in here, this door will, will close behind you, and then 
you touch this um, trigger here and it'll reposition the camera. So it's kind of um, focusing on this battle scene. So music triggers I've got a few of, which, you know, when the player makes their way down from this above ground area into this cavern, the smuggler's cave, there will be a transition in the music, just to kind of change the tone. You know, up here might be a nice um, Viking medieval type flair, very heroic. And as they make their way down, it'll turn into more like a dark, ominous type mood, which better matches this darker um, level down here. And then as they make their way back up and get back above ground, the old, um, the previous music track will kick in again. So that's kind of like a nice touch. That kind of stuff is not essential, but it just kind of adds, um, yeah, it just adds a bit to the polish. And similarly, I've got a light trigger that when the player enters and exits the cave, um, I trigger different light settings. So here you got light intensity trigger. And basically, I've got a simple script attached to it, which um, just changes um, the intensity of particular light. So let's have a look at the lights that I've got here. This level has four different lights. And I might just turn on the lights so you can see what's going on. I've got a background light, which illuminates the background. I've got an action area light, which illuminates the action layer, which is basically the player, um, enemies and anything directly on that um, kind of level. Then I've got a terrain light, which allows me to um, specifically change the terrain's illumination. And that's very useful because, um, you know, when the player is outside, you might have a nice bright uh, terrain. And when they hit that uh, lighting trigger that I mentioned earlier, then I can bring the terrain intensity a bit lower and just kind of have this more of a dark and um, ominous um, lighting because lighting is so important in setting mood. So in my cameras, I have my main camera rig. And my main camera rig, I use a few different cameras. Here I've got my orthographic camera, which renders the um, main layer where the player resides and all the kind of action um, components. And keeping it orthographic just keeps it nice and flat and manageable rather than kind of perspective shifts happening all over the place. But for that, I have a perspective camera, which uh, specifically, this one is for the foreground, where I can render, you can just faintly see here, I've got like the bushes in the foreground. I can render with that just the foreground stuff to give me a nice um, kind of depth of field effect. And then I've got my um, background layers, which are kind of attached to the main camera and they move together. And within those, um, the layers kind of have a parallax script, which has its own internal parallax system. So a few kind of things happening in unison together. So foreground holder, this was pretty cool. So you can see um, I have this dark foreground for this kind of subterranean cave, which is sort of like a smuggler's tunnel. Now I also have this folder called uh, deprecate, which is basically stuff that I'm phasing out. So here I had a bunch of uh, bushes that I was testing out. We're using like a mesh and deformation wasn't really working out, so I've kind of turned them off and marked them as deprecate. Now, why have I done that? Well, I might want to bring them back or I might want to still experiment with them. Basically, I'm not completely done. I was actually th planning to make a video uh, about these bushes specifically, so I might want to get some footage of those later on. So I'm just kind of temporarily keeping them there till I'm officially done, at which point I will uh, delete that. So I've got background elements, which are the kind of backing plates which I use. And I actually offset these slightly. So when you walk through this tunnel, you get a nice um, parallax effect with the wall. It's very subtle, but it's noticeable enough to create just a little bit of depth, you know, where often you might just get a, a flat wall. Another useful result of this organization structure is, say for instance, I wanted to turn off all my enemies because maybe I wanted to test my level flow and I didn't want to be having combat encounters constantly. So rather than trying to look up all my enemies or clicking them all one by one and turning them off, I can simply go to the enemies um, holder and in the inspector panel, I can just turn that off and press play. And that's it, no more enemies. So that has the potential to really speed things up during testing and development. So I've then got an effects folder, which within has a I mean, atmospheric effects 
and action effects. And basically, atmospheric effects are like wind effects and, you know, leaves falling from trees, stuff like that, um, where action effects are, well, specifically, I've got an enemy that's hiding under the ground here, for instance, and when I trigger a region, um, there is an effect here that kind of um, explodes and he will, whoa, jump out. So these are action effects, which means they're kind of um, integrated into the gameplay, I guess is a good way of putting it. So hopefully you found some bits and pieces in this video that you can perhaps take back to your own project and apply, perhaps in the areas of organization. You know, it's always good to have good, strong organization. Um, so please do drop the video a like. It really helps with the algorithm. Let's me know that this kind of video is good. And drop a comment. And, you know, if you have any of your own tips or you'd like to ask further questions about my approaches, and I'll, I'll do my best to kind of answer those. And on another note, I've been away for a while. You may have noticed it's probably been the longest I've gone without uploading. I had a family holiday and I took my my you know, family to relax and then I got back and I got immediately got sick um, from you know what so I was kind of laid out for for a week and now feeling um, better back and um, yeah ready to start a new phase of the channel you know I've got a new devlog that I'm working on um, which will be coming out soon hopefully so stay around for that and um, yeah I'll see you guys in the next video bye